with today sharing the message that life is good. All right, that's three of you. Maybe more of you will say amen by the time we finish. You may think, well, come on, Pastor, really? Have you lost your mind? Did you fall down and hit your head? What's wrong with you? Amen. Well, you don't have to lose what you never had. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I tell you what, I'm like Paul. I, I want the mind of Christ in me. But the fact of the matter is today, yeah, we've got a lot of struggles going on, craziness, things happening in our world, in our nations, in our families, in our community, in our state, you name it. But I'm going to tell you today, where's your focus? Where's your, where's your attention place today? Are you looking for the world to be your, your helper? Are you looking for the government debate today to be your solution? I'm going to tell you, you're looking in the wrong direction. Stay with me today. You're going to find out in this message that life is good. And this is really a, an encouraging message. And it's one of the encouraging messages that Solomon gives us. And about the only encouraging message of sort that he gives us. Because let me tell you what. Solomon hits us hard. In Ecclesiastes, he hits us hard. He hits us where we live. He calls us out. And he starts out by saying he's the preacher and all his vanity and vexation. I mean, boy, that is encouraging, isn't it? Didn't it just make you want to jump up and shout and say hallelujah? Well, well, not yet. Because life is tough, isn't it? But you're going to find today how life can be good. You know, um, I'm in Ecclesiastes 11 and picking up with verse 7 down through verse 10. Light and sun are symbols of life lived in the love of God. And we realize that. He took us out of the darkness and brought us into the light, didn't he? And the light of the world now lives within us by the process of salvation where we cried out for the mercy of God in salvation. And God saved us, redeemed us, and became our Lord. And just as we love to step outside when we see the sun break through this morning when I left home, the sun was just coming up. I get to church early. I don't know about you, but I get to church early. I wish some of you got here as early as I got here. But anyway, <laughs> some of you are just rolling over for your second nap. Amen. But when we step outside and we see the sun break through on a cloudy, gloomy, rainy day, you know, we can really today enjoy the love of God and we can sense today his acceptance and know today the joy of his presence. And you know, there's joy in his presence today, isn't there? Absolutely today. I know we're living in a bad world. I know we're living in tough times. But that does not take away the fact today that God is a good God. And he wants us to live today not controlled by the happenings that are around us, but by controlling what is living within us today. And that's the joy of the Lord today that will bring strength and help and encouragement in these days in which we're living. This is what really makes life beautiful. You know, life can be beautiful today, maybe, and, and certainly is enjoyable. And you may have been sitting at home thinking, when is it going to be over? When are we going to be past all this? When can I get my life back? When can I get back to normality? Well, take a deep breath because we're not there yet. But I'm going to tell you, in spite of all that, push that aside. Just push it off the table. And the one thing that you've got today that brings life and brings acceptance, and brings joy, and brings pleasure, and really brings today the blessings of God, is the pleasure that we have of being in His presence today. Amen. So we understand today that life can be enjoyable, life can be rejoicing today, and really when you think about the Lord, it makes life worth living, doesn't it? You know, you can sit at home and stare at the four walls and get depressed and defeated, and anybody can do that. Or you can rise up and say, my God is still alive, and I'm going to put my trust and confidence in him, and I'm not going to be controlled, manipulated by everything that I hear, see in this world. I'm going to look to the source of my real help, which is the Lord. Amen. And so David said that. He said, I looked unto the hills from which cometh my help, my help coming from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. So we've seen displayed throughout the book of Ecclesiastes the enjoyment that does not come from things. Some folks are things controlled. You can't be happy unless you got things. Let me tell you something today. A person's life today is not, does not consist of the abundance of the things that we possess. Because you know what? All that stuff is going to rot, decay, and fade away. When we were in Pigeon Forge uh, last week, and we went to the uh, museum about the Titanic. And I don't know if you know a lot about the Titanic, but they are saying just within a short amount of time, not even any evidence is going to be on the bottom of the ocean. 
because of the depth and because of what is happening and because of things that's totally decaying and it's just going to disappear. As massive as that ship was. And um, uh, one of the guys that helped to build that ship actually said that it was a ship so strong and so big that not even God could sink it. Well, on its maiden voyage, she went down. She sure did. I'd be careful what I say. But realizing this today, we put our confidence in the things of this world, and the things of this world is not going to get you to heaven, and will not bring joy into your heart and your life. Our God is living in today, and he wants today for us to have a relationship with him. God is anxious and sitting on the edge of the throne and, and, and really encouraging us to come into him and to find the hope and the help that we can only find in him today. And so today, we today can have a relationship, and that relationship comes by the process of salvation, of knowing the Lord as your personal Savior. No, it's not the preacher saving you. It's not the baptismal water saving you. It's not the church saving you. It's nobody saving you but Christ Jesus, because he is the source of all salvation. Amen. <laughs> Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes 11, and we're picking up with verse 7 and reading down through verse 10. Solomon said, truly, the light is sweet. Man, I just feasted on that this past week because in what I've been preaching in the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it has not been real sweet. It's been hard. It's been tough. It's really whipped us into shape. It's a boot camp in God's word to get us where we need to be. So he said, truly, the light is sweet and a pleasant thing is it for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in, that, in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh, here's that word again that Solomon continually uses, it's vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy mouth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh and child, for childhood and youth are vanity. May God have the blessing to the reading of his word. Solomon really mixes the words together there for us. But he begins in that first verse that I read to you in verse 7 about how life is sweet. You know, it's my desire today for you to receive healing and hope from the message that God has placed on my heart to bring to your attention. Additionally, today, I pray the Son of God's grace, His will, will shine down into your life and bring healing power that you can feel the true love that God has for you today. And I'm going to tell you, no one has ever loved you like God loves you today. No one would ever do for you what he has done for us. So, as we well know, we flip over to the New Testament for a moment. A very familiar passage. I think two of the most familiar passages that are found in the New Testament are 1 John 3.16. Everybody knows that. And I think the second one is probably Romans 8.28. And that is a beloved verse that we find in God's Word. Romans 8, and we preach through that here of the year. And it took us about 19 or 20 months to get through it, to it, and done with it. But it still lives within our heart. But Paul tells us in Romans 8, Paul makes one of the greatest promises that we can find in the entirety of the Bible for born-again Christians. You understand what's written in Romans 8, 28 is for you and I who are born again. This is not for the world that is lost. This is for the person that can be saved and experience the grace of God and then experience today the goodwill of God that he has for our life. But you realize this is an exclusive for Christians today. This is for you and I that we today can glean into our life and utilize and utilize to the point that it will lift us up in the storms, trials, and bad times that we're facing. And it gives us a promise. This is not, this is not suggested. This is a fact from God. This today is something you can anchor your life on. This is something you can build your relationship in. Paul said, and we know. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, that's, that verse, you break it down, and it's something here, and you've got to understand in the very beginning of that verse, in the very first three words that he says, and we know. 
Thank God we can know Him and thank God we can know His goodness. Thank God we can know His grace. Thank God we can know His forgiveness. Thank God we can know today the abundance and the bounty that we have in Him today. And this is not something that we guess at. This is something that we know, amen. That our God's an able and a good God, amen. So we know that He does what? He works all things together for good to them that love Him. Because believers love the Lord, don't they? And we love him, and he takes all the bad things of life, all the issues that we face, all the sicknesses that we go through, and he works them to good because of what? God has a purpose in what he is doing. Well, why am I going through this? Because God has a purpose. Why are we facing this as a nation, this crazy coronavirus? Because God has a purpose. And his purpose is to work his good in our life. Let's wake up to what God is trying to speak to us today. Amen. So, I then bring you a question. What Paul declared in Romans 8, 28, and what Solomon said about life being sweet, do you know that? Do you know that? Or is it just something that you've heard and you say, yeah, that really sounds good. But you haven't learned to apply it to your life. You haven't learned to lean on that. All you see is the dilemmas of life. All you see is the problems, the pains, the heartaches, the headaches. All you see is the valleys that you're going through. Did you know that in the midst of your valley today, there's one that is called Jesus? And he's the one that will guide you and even carry you through. You can't get through it by yourself. It's him that is with you, for you. And it's him today that will bring you through what you're encountering in life. You take all, you take all the events that we've faced in 2020 and even into the fourth months that we're in here in 2021. Much of which has included things like pain, frustration, things like tragedy, hurt, disappointment. Things like uh, depression, anxiety, and loss. I mean, we've all been affected by it, haven't we? We've all lived within that, haven't we? And with all this, do you still believe that Romans 8, 28, do you still believe what it says that God works all things together for good to them that love him? Could it be today that God is measuring our love for him? Could it be today that God is really, as the old saying goes, and growing up, my dad would say, you know, this lesson is to separate the men from the boys. I mean, this is a cutting edge, isn't it? It shows us where we are. It reveals where our trust is at. It's just not some pie in the sky that we grab and say, whew, that sounds good. I'm going to hang on to that. You can't hang on to it unless you're living what it says. You've got to live what God's word declares today. As a child of God, God has brought you through all of that, and you don't even realize it yet. All we're looking for is a way out, but are we looking for learning in what we're in what God has for us? That's the purpose. And so you realize today he did all of that good for you and I and what he accomplished at the cross that we could stand here today and proclaim that and say amen to it and receive that, believe that, and employ that in our lives. Those of you who are watching by home, let me tell you, life is good. Even though you're going through tough, hard times, God is still a good God. Amen. amen. Praise God. <laughs> so that being the case, how can you take today Romans 8, 28, how can you really take Romans 8, 28 and appropriate it for your life? Actually, today, the preacher here, Solomon, as he's called the preacher in, in Ecclesiastes 1, he helps us in Ecclesiastes 11. Certainly, Ecclesiastes is not known today for its uplifting tone. I mean, we face some hard stuff in going through 11 chapters of this book. I mean, God has put us up against the wall and paintbrushed our jaws a little bit to get our attention. You know? I promise you, I have never seen a car going down the highway that says, I love Ecclesiastes on a bumper sticker on the back of it. <laughs> and I would dare say it's probably not one even made. Now, I'm sure some of you will get some of that stuff you paint on the back of your windshield or your real glass and put on there, I love Ecclesiastes. Yeah, I want to see it if you do it, okay? Because you know what? This is not a book. As a matter of fact, I'll be honest with you. I can't ever remember hearing a preacher preach on the entirety of the book of Ecclesiastes. 
I've heard sporadically, you know, about the issues of life and, you know, the things that we face that's revealed, but I've never heard any in-depth message brought consistently about the book of Ecclesiastes. You're not going to hear, I promise you, you're not going to hear Joel Osteen preach this. You're not going to hear T.D. Jakes preach this. You're not going to hear Creflo Dollar preach this. They don't preach on Ecclesiastes. They'd rather give you prosperity gospel that gives you a false hope. I'm just being honest. If they're your heroes, they can be yours, but they're not mine. Thank you. But right here, we find near the end of this book, the preacher is reminding us that in spite of everything that you and I have ever encountered in life, everything that you have struggled with and through today, Solomon declares life is a gift and life is good in God. Amen. So our theme reads like this, and it's very simple and it's very profound and it's very straightforward. In Christ, life is good. Amen. Amen. In Christ, life is good. You need to say that on the count of three. Are you ready? One, two, three. Loud and clear. In life, Christ is good. Amen. Several points and very simple today. Three points and no poems. It's good to be alive. Point one. Solomon said the morning is sweet. Some of you this morning, the alarm clock went off and you didn't say, Good morning, Lord. You said, Good Lord, it's morning. You didn't want to get up. Those sheets had you embraced. Those cool temperatures, I mean, you just slid right down in there, and man, you dug your head into that pillow, and you did not want to move. You was even singing that old song, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I'm going to stay in the bed all day long, wearing my PJs, laying back, thinking life is good. Oh, come on. You know better than that. The passage in verse 7 is filled, though, with a common grace in actuality today, the grace of, that God gives all people. You realize today, the sun is just not shining today on just the believer. The sun is shining on all people today. Amen. That's a common grace. Because the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. You know, in the simple joy of walking out and feeling the warmth of the sun on your face, and I, I tell you, it's beautiful. I tell you, we had bad rains last night, yesterday, and it was so refreshing to walk out this morning, and the sun was coming up, and the birds were chirping. You ever notice something? Whether it's raining or whether it's dark uh, in the mornings or whatever, the birds are still singing, aren't they? They're not controlled by the elements, and, but we are, aren't we? You know, if it's a gloomy day, I just feel so gloomy. Why? Because God's still good, isn't he? You realize there's a good God who loves his good creation today. God made all of that. The grass that grows, the flowers that bud out, the, the fragrance of the roses blooming and all those things. God made that possible for you and I that we could enjoy today. And we take it for granted, don't we? You know, we think, well, I don't know why. And we just get in a mood because things are not like we want them to be. Life is not about how you want it to be. Life is about what God has for you that's far better than whatever you could imagine. For a Christian, we are today reminded that there is a good God, and you've got to understand this. Not only is he good in that creative acts of his, but he's also good in the redemption that he has provided, and he has saved us and brought us unto himself and brought us his favor and brought us his blessings and brought us his provision, and we are children of the Most High God. My heavens, does it get any better than that? You think about it. We'll be thankful today for that preserving grace that God has given us, that's got us thus far. You know, all the trouble you've been through, all the problems, loss, pain, sickness, suffering, you name it. Who's been that present help? Who's been that comforter? Who's been that friend? Who's been that one that's always there for you? Who's lifted you up? Who has done things in your life that nobody else could do? It's the presence of our God. That's who. He's always there. He's a present help in time of trouble. And this is exactly today. Listen, we need to thank God for his daily grace that he floods our soul with today. And as, as David said in Psalm 118, we really need today to connect with this in the fact today that he said, this is the day. 
This is the day which the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and what? Be glad in it. Amen. Well, you know, when I get through this, I'll do better. Are you? Why don't you do better now? Why can't you trust God to get you through? You know, when I get over this, this illness, illness, sickness, problem, pain, issues, whatever I'm facing, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to start serving. Why can't you serve God now? Amen. Don't you think God is able? Don't you think the God that supplied your salvation, that pulled you out of the mire and the sin that you were in, don't you think that he's enabled God to carry you through whatever you're facing? Don't you believe today that he's a mighty God? That he possesses all power in heaven and in earth? Do you believe today that there's a Lord God that's nothing too hard for thee? Do you believe today that our God is the only one today that can pluck us out of the snare of Satan and redeem our souls and write our name in heaven and give us joy unspeakable and full of glory and give us hope today that the world can't take from us? I'm telling you, he's a good God. Amen. Praise God. God has given us a good day to enjoy. Stop enduring. I'm just trying to... I hate this word. I'm just trying. There's two things I can't stand. I'm doing the best I can. I'm just trying to survive. Oh, for Pete's sake. Or as Tiff's cat says, for Pete's lake. We need to. No, the cat doesn't really talk. We need to. She thinks it does. We need to put some things into perspective. In these times that we find ourselves, I'm going to tell you what's happened over the last 12, 14, 16 months. We've lost our perspective. We really have. We go through the motions, but we've lost our perspective. You know, listen, in these times, if you're not careful, your attention can be distracted away from God. You, you can't let the pain the problems. You can't let what's happening in Richmond or Washington today control your life. Out of the weight of the great blessings today, you've got to understand God has given you something that's only found in Christ. Do you realize that we spend more time talking about what's wrong than we do who's right? We talk more about this, that, and the other instead of talking about what God has done for us. Let me give you an example of that. And here's Habakkuk, and he records, and he writes for us. And now listen to, the two verses here, and I want you to listen to the first one. And the first one, when you start listening to this and reading it, probably the corners of your mouth may drop a little bit. Because he says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields yield no more meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. I told 930 congregation, sounds like a good hee-haw song. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it wasn't for bad luck, I've had no luck at all. Gloom! <laughs> despair! Agony on me. But hear what Habakkuk said. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Amen. That's where we are to live. That's where we are to anchor our lives. That's where we are to trust today. The preacher is saying, oh, I know things are bad. And I know that pain is real. And we know that today in life. And I know today... All these issues, but I'm reminded today there's no pain and there today is no badness that can outweigh today the grace and the goodness of our God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We need to drink deep into the sovereignty of our God. We need to plunge in and, brother, I mean, go to the depths of it. We need it to surround us. We need to know today. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about today that God is in control. That's what I'm talking about. We need today to take confidence in that providence of God. And if you're a child of God, then today, guess what? You're in his hands. And if you're in his hands, no one, no being, no, no power can pluck you out.
You are sealed unto the day of redemption. What are you going to do with that? Well, I believe you can lose your salvation. Oh, really? What are you going to do with that? But just rip it out of the Bible then. Sealed unto the day of redemption. Nobody can pluck you out of the hand of God. And how did you get permission to do that on your own? You can't. Also, someone says every decision that you make does not have to be agonizing today. You know, we agonize in that decision process and we just get so overwhelmed and so overcome by it. Let me give you a solution for that. You don't have to struggle today to decide in your Christian life. You trust the Lord. You take it to him. You put your confidence in him. He gives you the peace and you go with the plan of God. It's that simple. So you can trust today. See, we want to complex things. We want to make them complex and we want to add to them. We just want to get so stressed out. Man, I'm so stressed. Whew. Why? I'll tell you why. You are stressed out because you choose to be stressed out. Rather than trust the Lord with all your heart. Rather than acknowledging him in all your ways today. You can trust God's providence that will work everything together for your good. I never told you that you may not have to go through the valley. But I'll tell you what, if you go down in the valley and through the valley, God will bring you through the valley that you're going through. Amen. Amen. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. It could have been an 11-day journey. Why did they not get there in 11 days? Because they were following their flesh and not following God. And that is our problem today. We struggle because we are trusting flesh and what we think rather than trusting what God says in his word. Amen. If we can learn today to trust God, I'm telling you right now, he'll relieve the pressure, he'll give the answers, and you can live in the victory of the Lord today. That's not prosperity gospel, that's Bible theology, amen. You finally come to the place, life in Christ is good. Life in Christ is good. Life in Christ is good. It is good to know God, secondly. To know God is to fear God. See, we need ground to stand on, don't we? We really do. When you're standing on your own merits and your own life and your own thoughts and whatever else, that's shallow ground and it's going to crumble. But when you stand on what God has declared in his word, that's an anchor. That ground is made solid by the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And underneath this, suffering then becomes real, doesn't it? I'm not taking away today. I'm not painting some picture today. Oh, don't even look at suffering. You're not in it. No, you do face suffering. But you've got to grasp the fact is that you're not facing suffering alone. That he is that God who is with you today. He said the days of darkness are many. And they are. We're living in dark times. I'm appalled that our state government is going to legalize marijuana. How? dreadful. I'm appalled that our nation will legalize abortion. I'm appalled today of the level that we have fallen to and the depths that we've gone to today, but isn't that the day we're living in? But it does not shake today my faith that I have in my God. These are the times. Times are bad. And didn't Jesus tell us these things would happen? I mean, in the last days, perilous or troublesome times would come. But this really, you think about what Solomon said. It's a haunting phrase that he gives us about darkness. And there will be days that we'll be shrouded in darkness. It happened to Elijah. Here's the man that went to, to Mount Carmel and prayed a 62, 63 word prayer. Fire fell and destroyed everything that Baal stood for. And then he gets scared of Jezebel and he runs and he hides under a juniper tree. And he says, I'm so tired of this. I just wish I were dead. You ever said that? Be honest. Don't answer. I just wish I was dead. Well, you may not wish you wish if you would die in, with that mentality. The man who's a forerunner of Christ. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist. While in prison, his faith wavered, didn't it? So you realize that's in our humanity. That's in our frailty today. This is you having your faith tested. And I'm going to tell you, you will have your faith tested. God's going to see what you're made of. God's going to see how much you're relying upon him.
This is having today your faith actually not only tested, but refined and purified. This is faith that passes the test. Job did. Think about Job. Lost his 10 kids, lost everything, respect, you name it. Wife told him, curse God, die. Friends accused him of something he didn't do. He didn't do. And what did Job do? Through all that he went through, he said, God, even though you slay me, yet I will still praise you. Amen. Amen. This is trusting God. Even though today you're bruised. You know, the word of God talked about a bruised reed. He said, for a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. That's what our God does. Peter talked about this. He's talked about the trying of your faith. And when you go through these things, that you would, that trying of your faith would develop your life and it would be more precious than gold that perishes. And he said, even though it's tried with a fire, that it would be found unto praise and glory and honor at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This is you today in your life believing even though you're going through some suffering and trials and valleys and tough, tough times, this is you saying, you know, God, I realize it's only for you to sanctify me, to use me, to refine me, and to make me today more trusting of you. This is you doing exactly, I love this. I discovered this little saying from Spurgeon. I love the writings of Spurgeon. I don't know if you know about the life of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was an English preacher. He died at an early age. He went through a lot of trouble. He combated depression terribly. He went through a lot of difficulty. But in his preaching and in his writing, if you really want to read something good, read The Treasure of David by Spurgeon. I'm telling you, I've got two volumes of it this thick, and it is awesome. But hear what Spurgeon said. He says, I've learned to kiss the wave that cast me on the rock of ages. I've learned to kiss the wave. I've learned to kiss the difficulties, the hard places, the times that I've been down, the places of depression, the places of disappointment, the places of hurt, the places of rejection, everything. You know what it's done? It's pushed me to the rock of ages. It's made me cleave to the power of God that lives within me. It's made me trust this one who today is worthy of my praise, amen, for he is the rock that we build our lives on, amen. Let me hurry up and finish. This is you learning today to know God in the dungeons of pain that we face. This is you learning to know God in the fullness of who he is and what he wants to do. This is you understanding today that this God uses everything to draw you into the process of sanctification that you will walk with, trust in, and put your confidence in this God of heaven. But there's something else Solomon is introducing. He talked about a judge, didn't he? The Bible, of course, God in the Bible, he speaks of being holy. And every person will stand before God. Hebrews tells us that. It's appointed unto man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. And there's a guilt today that runs so deep that has really stained our lives tremendously today. The only hope of removing today the stain and the guilt that we find ourselves in is the sinless Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Your way out of sin is to come to Jesus Christ. Are you saved today? I'm in church, Pastor. Come on. That doesn't make you a Christian. You've got to come to the realization that all of sin and come short of the glory of God. You've got to face the facts today, the soul that sinned shall surely die. You've got to face the fact today, to die without Christ means you're going to the pits of hell. Separated. And you'll be in intense pain for eternity. The good news is you don't have to do that. He's offered you a way of salvation. Today, the blood of Jesus can blot out your every sin, transgression, or iniquity. And today, he can put you today in the family of God by you confessing that you're a sinner and asking him to forgive you of that sin and inviting him into your heart and your life. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when you turn from your sins and you turn to Christ, there you will find life and there you find our God's good. One more point. 
It's good to be content. Question. You say, you sure are asking a lot of questions today. <laughs> well, you might be up here doing the same thing if it was you. So, what are you worrying about? What's pulled you down? What's caused depression to basically occupy your mind, your life? Why can't you put your attention on God? It just seems like your mind, you can't get focused. Because you're so consumed with everything in or around you today. I mean, people have absolutely worried themselves literally to death about coronavirus. What are you scared of? Where's your faith? Why aren't you enjoying life? Come on, preacher. Don't you know we're in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, I've been right in the middle of it too. I, I realize what's happening. But I'm not going to let that stop me from enjoying the Lord in my life. I'm not going to let that stop me from enjoying life. Because that's what God wants you to do. And you know, when you walk with Him and your, your, your mind and your heart and your life is focused and centered and shrouded by His presence, then you're not walking around with that defeative attitude, critical of everything and everybody. All of a sudden you see the one true high lifted up and glorious God, how real he is and life is enjoyable. As I walked out this morning, the sun was coming up. I got up early as I do. It looks like every morning I get up early. I can't control that. I don't even use the alarm clock no more. Don't need it. Just wake up early. Wake up early. It's just the way it works. So I left this morning. You know, the dog gets bored with me being around. And he tells me, why don't you go in church? And uh, no, not really. You say, oh, Tiff's cat talks to her and your dog talks to you. Well, he was stood there this morning. He was hungry, and his mouth was just going pop, 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 like that. I thought, you must be hungry. I am too, but I'm not going to eat, and you are. But anyway, <laughs> but when I left at home this morning, the sun was coming up, and I thought, oh, glorious day. Hear those birds singing. See the budding of the flowers and the trees and the tulips popping out of their ground and waving at you. Man, I have to say, life is good. And I'm glad I can be content in what God has done in my life today. Contentment is not found in stuff. It's found in a relationship. You'll never find contentment today in finding yourself filled with anger, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, hurt, all these issues, all these things. You'll never find contentment in that. The removal of this process is called forgiveness. And you need to ask God to forgive you for being that way. And to put a smile on your face and to put joy in your heart. You know, I, I gauge people's lives. If you walk around with a frown on your face all the time, you're probably about as angry inside as you are outside. I try to smile. Sometimes it's hard. But I try to smile because that really makes people wonder, what in the world are you up to now, duck? I found to be content. And the only contentment I can find today is not found out there. It's found in Him. Amen. 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 Contentment begins when you put today the vices of this world away and you anchor your life on the one that has delivered you and saved you, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Our contentment comes in Christ today. And only Christ today will give you life that is good. So what are you struggling with today? What's got you all bound up and hung up and strung out? And what's causing all this craziness in your life? And why don't you just let go of all that stuff today? Why don't you come to an altar and say, Lord, I'm just letting go of everything. I'm going to put my trust in you. I'm going to stop this process of worrying because it's making my hair just like the preachers. <laughs> Not really. I'm serious. If you need Christ, you can come. If you need help, you can come. If you need hope, if you, can, you can come. If you've got lost lovers, you can come. If you need strength today, direction, leadership, if you need help from above, to, whatever the need is in your life, here's a God that will meet that need, and you finally can walk through life saying, Life is good, and God is awesome. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet, please. Father, right now, I don't know what need resides in the hearts of your people, but I do know this, you'll, you'll meet that every need. I pray right now, if it's anyone lost, that they will cry out 
to the Lord and say, God, I'm a sinner. I'm in need of your salvation. Forgive me. Forgive me of my sin of rejecting you. Come into my heart. Come into my life and save me right now. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul.